Greetings, fellow football managers. Today, I'm going to talk about defense. I've had a lot of questions about things like setting up a low block, but I feel like my videos are a little bit more focused on the beginner football manager or the slightly less experienced one, even though I think more experienced managers can take a little bit away from this. Even so, it is a game, and if you're really good at it and understand this stuff better than me, which a lot of people do, I would love it if you dropped a couple of tips and tricks down below that the rest of the community can learn from. But I'll try and do my part with this which is a little bit of a waffle on defending. Now, for me, defending boils down to three basic things. Where you win the ball, how you win the ball, and who you win the ball with. Because defending is part of your football tactics, and your football tactics are all about winning the game, and you can only win the game, really, if you score a goal. There are tactics like the Catenaccio, which plays for the nil-nil or the one-nil, which really is a little bit anti-football, but it's kind of died out. There's not much call for it anymore. That's not very ambitious, and you do need some really good players to pull it off in any case. Going back to those three pillars of where you win the ball, how you win the ball, and who you win the ball with, I'm looking at Sheffield United in-game. I've just started a game against Arsenal. As you see, the clock hasn't moved up yet. So I'll try and get a couple of in-game examples of things going on with you here. But talking about where you win the ball, that's where the pressing conversation begins with. As you can see, I've just laid out a random little tactic. I've not thought about it very much. I've just set it up in a counter-attacking kind of fashion. But we're looking at this low block. That is the where you win the ball part of the conversation. There are three possible blocks that you can go for. Number one is a low block, number two is a mid block, and number three is a high press. This is very much a factor of your tactical principles. If you're planning to try and pressure the opposition high up the field, maybe you've identified a couple of weaknesses in their structure, maybe their defenders aren't very good on the ball, maybe you just want to force them into playing longer balls, you might be able to try and press them nice and high and make them play the ball a bit more direct through the lines or something like that, it has a downside, you are opening up space. So defending is all about space and time. When you high press, you're generally hassling and harrying the opposition all over the pitch. So you're denying them time, but as you can see, you've opened up a lot of space. If you want to constrict space, you're probably going to press a lot lower. You're going to go something like a low block and you are going to give them more time on the ball, especially in their half. As you can see, your players are not engaging. So this line of engagement is about when your players start to put pressure on the ball carrier. So you're giving them free reign of their own half and you're only trying to engage inside your own half. That's the definition of a low block. You can still vary the low block a little bit by changing your defensive line. You can compress it to the max like this and minimize the amount of space in between your players. This will make it really hard for the opposition to play inside of your defensive structure. So this is more of a vertical compression. By playing a really high defensive line and a low block, you're creating this really almost a third of the pitch where you're playing football in. The problem here is you're seeding space up there at the back or in the opposition half, and you're also seeding space behind your defensive line, which can cause problems because if they get the chance, they'll try and play through. You are compressed, so you're denying that, but they might also play over. Really good players, such as what Arsenal have, they've got a guy called Odegaard who has 19 vision. He is going to kill you if you try to do this by just flipping a ball over the top of your really high defensive line. So, a lot of the time you need to take various things into consideration, such as who you're playing against, who are the danger men there, can you actually execute the defensive tactic that you're trying to execute based on the opposition. If you're playing against a big striker like Romelu Lukaku, for example, you're going to need defenders who can take care of him. If we look at these defenders, we've got jumping reach 15 there, we've got jumping reach 12, we've got jumping reach 15. So a really big striker is going to have a field day against these defenders because he can simply out jump them. So what do we need to do in that case? If we've got a small defense, relatively speaking, we would then need to shut down the supply and we would need to try and prevent crosses from going into that big striker. So compression was that big topic there and let's look at it again. This is the least amount of compression you can have because you're dropping your defensive line low. The benefit of that is you're denying them space to play behind. 
the bad thing here is you're inviting a hell of a lot of pressure into your own box. This is extremely dangerous, even here, can be extremely dangerous in Football Manager 24. It is just a game. And if you're playing a weaker team like this, where you have defenders who can't really concentrate, if we hover over again, we've got concentration of 13, anticipation 14, agility 9. So he's not going to be able to get to the ball that quickly. We've got our left back who has concentration of 12, agility 12, anticipation 14, marking only 13. These aren't brilliant defenders who can do that job. These are not Leonardo Bonucci and Giorgio Chiellini who can absolutely kill opposition players when they're in and around that defensive area. So playing a low block depends very much as well on the quality of your team and the players that you have. So with this team here, Sheffield United, I would not play a low block because I don't have any confidence on the ability of my players to withstand lots of pressure. But at the same time, you need to make sure that the configuration here, the low block and the low line is consistent with your formation. As you can see here, I'm playing a essentially a 4-5-1, which is very, very deep. That is good for a low line and a low block. In fact, I might be able to push the line up to standard and compress just a little bit more because I have so many players at the back and doing that defensive duty and compressing the field in that area, in the deeper part of that field. If I played with a more offensive formation, something like that, I would really, really struggle to play a low block. Look at this. There's lots of spaces opening up now. You've got the space just in behind the winger on both sides, and then you've got the space here in between the midfield and the defensive line. Even when I've compressed, as I compress, you've still got those little pockets of space. There's no space up here. This is super compressed. This is great. But here, there's still those little pockets of space where the opposition can hurt me. in. That is not the greatest idea because my formation is pushed up a little bit too high to execute the low block and low defensive line that I'm trying to do. So with pressing, one of the most important things is to match up your block and line with the formation that you have. You could do something crazy, like this for example, split your team into two halves, so you've got the defense of six essentially, although you can have a runner between the two, or two runners, or more runners between the two halves, and you've got your offensive four. Now when we look at the block, look at that. It separates out into two very specific units, where you've got your pressing unit, and then you've got your defensive line unit. This can be actually quite interesting to play a system like this, a really stretched out system. So what you need to be aware of is that you're giving up space in this midfield area. So if the opposition has two or three CMs, not DMs or AMs, just CMs, they will be completely alone in space and they can try and dictate the game from there unless you do something to counter that. But what you're doing with a high press and a low defensive line here is you are putting pressure on the opposition defense and trying to ask them to kick it long. In which case, you then have the four defenders and the two defensive midfielders to try and win that header and or win the second ball with these two DMs. So that is definitely a tactic as well. So force the long ball and then sweep up those second balls. I've seen a few funky tactics which do this kind of thing, but there is a plan behind it. You're just not going willy-nilly. Standard high press would be something like this where you push up higher. And again, you're pressing with this line, but then you're inviting them to play in behind if they can. And you've got some, again, that second ball winning power too. The problem here with this situation is that you're giving up that central midfield again, but now the central midfielders can play through balls down the flanks or balls, little clip balls over the top down the flanks, and that could hurt you as well. So it really depends where you want to give up ground and it depends which grounds you want to actually contest. So winning the ball or where you win the ball is all about the press. If we just go back to this low block shape there, and let's bring the positions back into something a little bit more sane. So this is kind of what we had uh, before. Now, we, as you can see, we have a nice low block. We've got a low defensive line, and we're telling our opponents, okay, you can kind of play it around the halfway line, but the moment you come in, we are going to then engage you, and we've got nine players there. I'm not saying this is a great tactic. In fact, it's a pretty crap tactic, to be honest, but it's just a little example that I've cooked up to try and evoke that low block and show you what's going on. Also the defensive mentality over here, that provides a little bit of lateral compression. The problem with the Football Manager Tactics Creator, before if, you, if you're coming from sort of Football Manager 07, 08, you used to be able to set up the, the width of the team in defense as well with the slider. Now you can just choose mentality which will affect your defensive width a little bit. Also your attacking width, 
that is in possession and then attacking with, that can adjust your defensive width too. That's a little bit misleading, and it could actually be anecdotal, but I feel like that does affect things as well. So where you win the ball, that's all about where you are setting up your pressing. However, that is not it. We also need to think about our pressing trap. Pressing trap, trap inside or trap outside. Now, if you look at this formation that I've got going on here, I don't really think I need to set up a pressing trap because of the fact that it's so compact in that low area, it's gonna try and absorb pressure and try and ping the ball out fairly quickly. I don't really need to establish an elaborate pressing trap. A big mistake would be to go trap inside if you don't have that strength in the middle of the park, especially a defensive midfielder is very, very critical to trap inside. Trap outside, on the other hand, is gonna use the bylines as part of your press. So that's something we had from Guardiola some 10 years ago or something like that, where he used to talk, I think, about using the lines as another defender. Because obviously the attacker can't pass the ball out, then you're turning over possession. So defenders could press the attackers against that line and try and isolate them from the rest of the team, cut off passing lanes, force them into making bad decisions, make them attempt a risky dribble, win the ball that way. Because you're cutting off exactly half of the field to them when you're pressing them against that line. Trapping outside doesn't exactly mean press against the line, it just means to the outside. So that could be the line, but it could just be to keep the play on the outside. Let's jump into the game and see if we can see some examples of that low block and low defensive line. Before I do that though, I do need to touch a couple of the other tenants. Who wins the ball, the third of those three pillars, that's kind of covered if I say trap inside because then it's gonna be those ball winners who are winning it. Like this, basically anyone is able to win it in that midfield line, the defensive midfielder, maybe even the defenders. Everybody's kind of getting involved in this. But I need to point out one thing. The trigger press up there, which is currently set to slightly more often, that means that players will leave the position that you see here on the graphic. They will leave that position a little bit more, slightly more often, to try and engage the player with the ball, to try and press the opposition. If I set it to here, they're gonna engage even further away from their position with more intensity. Because they're gonna go so far away from their position in this setting, you might see two or more players leave their positions and go for the player because he's basically within their press radius. If I bring this down, that press radius reduces and obviously you're gonna get a slightly less intense press. You're not gonna have that wolf pack jumping on the player with the ball because he, the player with the ball might be outside a lot of their radii. You might just have one player pressing in these situations. If you wanna go down here less often and much less often, that is more of the standoff style of defending the old structural defensive setup. So this shape, it looks okay for a structural defensive setup because I've kind of got two good lines. I've got a player between the lines. It looks pretty nice and structured. So I could go for a more old school defensive structural setup where I'm not actually pressing that often. That answers the question, how you win the ball? Because when you have your press up here, you're gonna actually put a lot of pressure on the opposition. You might be able to make a tackle you might be able to get them making a risky ball, playing a premature pass, something like that. In this case, with less often, you're kind of holding to your position, you're letting them come to you, and you're not leaving your position for them. So you might win the ball by interceptions, which is why this kind of style, this standoff style, tended to be used by those Italian teams with the amazing defenders who could read the play, make interception. Guys like Fabio Cannavaro used to be amazing, Alessandro Nesta would be fantastic in these defensive styles. They would just cut out balls, they would mark their strikers. You have absolutely no chance against them when they played in this kind of style. So let's try this less often press, lower defensive style and low block and see what it looks like in the match engine. All right, so we've had a break in play. Arsenal have a throw in and we're gonna see what our defending looks like. As you can see, there's not much pressing going on. They're just getting in position. They're trying to hold a little bit of a structure there was a bit of a press there, to be fair. Yep, a little bit of pressure. But Saliba doesn't have any pressure on him, so you can see that pressing line. And there you go. Jack Robinson intercepted the ball. He was tied to his man, he intercepted. Unfortunately, we don't really have a counter-attacking opportunity there. That was poor. So we've given the ball straight back to Arsenal. Zinchenko has it. Not too much pressure.
And we've nailed it again. So we're waiting for the opportunity and then winning the ball. We're not really chasing them like crazy. So this is a little bit more old school. The counter isn't as quick as you might want, but now we've moved into a little bit of space. And, oh my word, what was that? So that's the kind of thing, if I can pause the game right here, as Odegaard tries to break, that is the kind of thing you're going to get on a defensive mentality. Unfortunately, the problem with lower mentalities like defensive, especially very defensive and even cautious sometimes, the player who did that was Baldock. So if we look at him, look at his mentality, it is cautious. So they have a more defensive outlook. Now defensive outlook means we are going to try and prioritize not giving away a goal over scoring a goal. We're not going to take a through ball, we're going to try and retain possession. And in that instance on the field, Baldock didn't really have any passing options and he didn't really aggressively try to drive at the opposition player, even though he can do it. He has dribbling 12, he's got flair 13, acceleration 14. He should have been taking on his man and trying to go past him and whipping in across. Unfortunately, he just gave the ball away. So that is something that can really frustrate a lot of players. And that's why a lot of players don't like to play on defensive or cautious or something like that. Because you get those things where you're thinking to yourself, we had the ball, we were kind of on a counterattack, why didn't he go? So to alleviate that problem, I'm going to go all the way up to attacking. This is going to be fun. So look, I'm still in a low block, although the block has gone up a little bit thanks to the mentality. I'm still in a lower defensive line and trigger press has gone to slightly less often. I think it was uh, just less often before. Yeah, it was on less often before. We're now slightly less often. So changing your mentality affects a lot of these things as well. Unfortunately, I don't have a good middle point there. It's slightly less often or much less often. You know what? Let's go for much less often and trust our structure, but also have an attacking mentality. To illustrate what happens, George Baldock here is now on positive. He was on cautious before. So let's see if that has any changes. Obviously, we're going to have to let things play out first. All right, just jumping back in, we've won the ball off Udegaard. So we've waited for the, the error and made another interception. There you go once more. But you can see how LaRucci moves really slowly, not very aggressively, because my tactical changes haven't actually gone into effect. Now there's a foul and now they'll go into effect. So let's see what happens. So just a second there. You see how much space there is here in the opposition third. I'm playing a low block, so my team is not interested in getting there. I'm not preventing short GK distribution. If I was, my players would be way further forward, preventing that easy short pass from the goalkeeper to Gabriel. So if I want to actually stop them from doing that, I would click prevent short GK distribution. That's normally employed in a high press tactic, but Sean Dyche has talked about using it in a defensive tactic, for example. So you can absolutely do it to try and force the opposition to play a long ball or something like that. You could definitely try it. Even with two or three men up there, you might be able to either force a mistake or make them play the long ball, which you think you can defend. Okay, resuming with the game, Gabriel's coming out with the ball. As you can see, my players are kind of in position, but they're not putting in any pressure at all. LaRucci gets back. And we're inviting Arsenal on. We're not engaging them. We're hoping for structure to do the job. And there we go. Gabriel Jesus hasn't taken a very good touch because my players were in the right position. So now that we have possession of the ball, it's been a goal kick. We are driving forward. We're making passes, much more energetic movement. We're taking players on. Unfortunately, we've lost out there. And Arsenal have a chance to counter back through our structure. The point was, I saw a lot more pace, a lot more energy in our players' attempts to play. And there, there's a tackle high. So that was our pressing line, as you saw, just above the halfway line. So immediately, we, we made the tackle when it was there to be made. Bang, win the ball. Came from the north side to win the ball. And now we've got the ball. Unfortunately, there was no opportunity to counter. But let's look at the energy that the players are exhibiting. Look at that. Much nicer passing. They're trying things little touch past the player. Those are the things they won't really attempt in a more defensive mentality, especially in defensive, very defensive. They're not going to do that stuff. But right now with an attacking mentality, but a low block, our players are being much more assertive and they're playing with more energy. They're trying to take more risks, to be honest. Think Thomas Frank said in an interview that um, not taking any risk is a risk in and of itself, to paraphrase. Um, so I prefer these higher mentalities because it just seems to get more even out of a defensive setup like this low block. Unfortunately, 
the opposition can still play through you. As you saw there with Havertz, that should have been a goal for Arsenal. It's just that our players, again, they were in a good position to recover and they were able to cut that ball out inside the six. But normally when the ball goes in the six-yard zone, you are giving up a goal. The point being here is that you're seeing a tactic which is more standoff, it's low block, it is pretty low intensity in terms of pressing and so on. I've dialed that down really far. Uh, but it is doing a good job. It is winning the ball when the ball is there to be won. We are making tackles. There we go. Um, and we are looking to counter when it's on. Unfortunately, it's not been on that much. So there may be a couple of tweaks and things I need to do to my player roles and positions to enable that. But that's a discussion for another time. From what I can see, this structural defensive setup is working quite nicely. So coming back into the tactics here, we've seen how the low block, lower defensive line, and a much less often trigger press can create that really old school defensive kind of setup where you're relying on structure, you're making good interceptions, you're making tackles only when the ball is there to be won. So if we dial things the other way, if we max this out to much more often, and we're in attacking, so it's going to be really a lot of pressing, let's see what the difference is. All right, we're in the new tactical setup now with a lot of pressing. Arsenal have just won the ball in a crowded area of midfield. Let's see what happens. So immediately you can see two or three players on Martinelli at that moment. You can see the intensity of press and you can see how it's working. That tackle by Robinson was mistimed. But immediately on Martinelli, you just saw three players converge on him, which wasn't happening before. It was just one, maybe two in certain positions. But now it's three because we've dialed up the pressing intensity. We are letting players come out of their positions to press more. That was a good interception, but our striker, unfortunately, is all the way back. So that is one of the big issues when it comes to playing a super low block here, is actually figuring out how you're going to counter where you can put players and be a threat going forward. And there, Saka's done amazingly well. He's beaten our player with a bit of skill. And pressing doesn't help with that sort of thing because you press him and then he beats you because he's such a good player. He's got so much flair, dribbling and all of that. They can avoid a press, especially if it's just one man pressing them. There's just no point. So that's another reason why you don't really have this kind of pressing intensity normally in such a low blocking system. So how you win the ball... We saw in such a low system, it can be really good to not press too much. Wait for your opportunity and then make the tackle or interception as a how you win the ball pillar. And pressing intensity, we can work in other ways. So I'm back into my tactical creator now. And I'm actually going to go up to a mid block. Now, do I want a lower defensive line with a mid block? Probably not. What I'm going to do is go for standard. Oh, you know what? Let's be cool. Let's go for a higher defensive line. We obviously don't want to press much more often. That's a little bit crazy. We're also going to bring the mentality down to balanced. So the, the attacking mentality was a choice just to show you how you can actually execute a low block tactic while not being super duper defensive and actually letting your players have a chance of making those big counterattacks and breaks. Although it didn't really come to anything in those couple of opportunities that I saw because my roles and positions and such aren't perfect in this. So this is a mid block. Now in the mid block, you're looking more at winning the ball in the midfield, in the middle of the pitch. As with a low block, we had lots of players really far down the field. Now we need to have more players in the middle area of the field. Trigger press more often because I don't really want to rely on my structure so much when I'm on a mid block. Because Arsenal have the quality to play it through me, over me, dribble past me, as Saka just did a moment ago, they can do all kinds of things to get through me. So I'm actually going to press more often and I'm going to try and crowd the midfield. With the mid block, you might actually be able to put a couple of players in these kinds of positions. So you can absolutely play a 4-3-3 and execute a mid block. Let's look at it now. Again, you have that first pressing line now of three players and then you've got the, the three players in the middle. In terms of roles, again, I'm not fully set on these. They're not the best roles and combinations, but let's just let it be for now. What I'm trying to do really is to show you a mid block We've also compressed, so we've used the principle of compression by moving the defensive line up, and we've moved the trigger press up. So we actually want to win the ball by pressing intensely rather than standing off. So that's the how. The where is going to be in the midfield region of the pitch, and the who is basically going to be these guys. 
We can look at the wingers. We can probably look at the fullbacks winning it. We can also look at the three guys in the middle. Maybe even the striker, but I doubt it, since the striker has to work against a lot of players. So let's see how this looks. In terms of these things, I'm not really going too far into them. Get stuck in, for example. I think I've mentioned on a previous video that you're going to attempt more low percentage tackles, which means giving away more fouls and stuff like that. Do we want to do that? Not really. There might be certain players where you do that, where they have low aggression and low bravery. So when they see somebody hurtling in on a tackle, they might just get out of the way. That is a very legitimate way to play against technical players, for example. Bully them off the ball. It works in real life. It works in football manager as well. You see a guy with low bravery, go ahead and hard tackle him because he's not going to be up for the 50-50. So that's something you can do against a team that is low on bravery. If you've got a team of cowards, basically, punch them. So get stuck in can work in certain situations, but stay on feet, again, is a good one to avoid yellow cards. Just make those high percentage tackles. So that could be a good instruction for telling your players, okay, only make a tackle when the ball's there to be won. So you could have really high pressing and stay on feet. So you're maximizing your intensity, you're really putting the pressure on, but you're not trying to go in for the tackle unless the ball is there to be won. You're just trying to put on the intensity. So you can make those little combinations of things very well. A defensive line is another thing. So with higher, I might step up the defensive line and that allows me to compact the pitch, give the opposition a little bit less room. Do I want to do that in this formation? No. But if I went with a 4-2-3-1 with midfielders, as we saw before, with a lot of space in this midfield area, stepping up might be a good thing to do. Again, you have to watch out for the long ball behind you. You can also drop off. So in this formation drop off might work a little bit because I do have somebody in the defensive midfield area so I don't mind stretching the defensive line back a tiny bit more however it does invite a lot of pressure so do you want to play drop off with a low line probably not because then you're basically inviting the opposition into your six yard box and that can be fatal Stop crosses and invite crosses is another thing. Are you comfortable with the ball being crossed in? You might invite them if the opposition doesn't have a tall man. Then again, they could whip the ball in. They could play low crosses. They could really kill you with these. So I leave them as is, uh, just hoping that my defenders can deal with what crosses comes in. But my defensive tactics tend to be more about fiddling the pressure, either going with a pressing tactic or a standoff tactic, figuring out where I want the block. Because it's not just a matter of who is playing for my team or who my team is. It's a matter of who are my players and where are the best sort of tackling stats, the work rates. Can my wingers, so I've got this guy playing out of position here as a right winger, tackling 14, work rate 15, teamwork 15, stamina 17, agility 15, acceleration 13, aggression, anticipation, bravery. You know what? This guy looks like a really good ball winner. In fact, the game tells me his best position is midfielder center with ball winning midfielder defend as a duty. So I'm playing him in at right wing, which is a crazy idea, but he actually can win the ball. So my right winger should be able to win the ball a fair bit. My left winger, I think, is LaRucci, who is a fullback by trade. Ugh, stats aren't great, let's be honest, but he does have work rate and teamwork and stuff. So he could do a job. So I am fairly confident in this midfield unit pressing up and winning the ball, but only when the opposition come into this zone. So I'm not challenging them in their own box. I'm going for a midfield versus midfield battle. Let's go back into the game and wait for a break. All right, there's been a throw in. Arsenal have the ball, which is exactly what we want to see. So this is all my pressing zone, technically. Saliba's just outside it, so McBurney's going to wander in. Here we go. Odegaard on the ball, but he's so fast with the ball. Um, okay, that was an unforced error by Arsenal, I think. So can we play it out? We are on balanced again. We're not on attacking. But we've got a free kick in the middle of the park. Now there's one very, very important thing. If you're playing an underdog team, you have the option of, in possession, playing for set pieces. Right there. If you are the underdog, that may be a really good idea. And in fact, a lot of real-life managers talk about that as using set pieces as a way to get themselves up the field. You win the free kick in the middle, then you win the free kick in the final third, and hopefully you have a really good set piece set up where you can maximize your advantage from those situations, get a goal and a counter and a free kick, and you know hold on for the 1-0 or the 1-1 or something like that. So that is very legitimately a way to play as an underdog, playing for set pieces, and it's something you shouldn't sleep on. I might do a video on set pieces in the future, let's see, but back to the game. 
just jumping in here, it's it's still kind of the extended phase that we were attacking from before, but we're moving the ball up the field. Now we've got to throw in on the far side and Arsenal get the ball because I haven't configured my throw-ins properly. That was Jack Robinson. He's got long throws of 18. So you can pump them in. So again, we're not challenging Arsenal up here. So we're letting them build up, but now they're in our pressing zone. As you saw, my left back jumped out of his position to try and close down Saka as he picked up the ball around the halfway line. And Davies is pressing in this area, which you did not see back when we were using the low line and low block, where Zinchenko just took that free kick. So we are, as you can see, attacking them a little bit higher. Our defensive line is a little bit higher. And they're playing the ball side to side. They're playing the ball up in the air which they didn't do before. And boom, they have the goal because they were able to get into that space. I'm going to let the uh, replay run. Oh no, we're going to have a VR thing. I'm going to skip that. Okay, the replay is showing us Saka playing this big long ball, but you can see all the space here. I do have four players in, but this is an inverted winger. He's not a right midfielder. If he was a right midfielder, he'd probably have been a bit further back and in position. Ball goes out to Zinchenko. And Martinelli has moved into that space there. And our boy Baldock has not tracked him. So they've got these three players one-on-one -on -one in this area. And our fullback has not tracked the inverted winger. So that's basically a, a bit of a marking error. But also potentially an error from my tactics where I'm not defensively sound enough. Then again, it is bloody Martinelli. Who is absolutely incredible on Football Manager. Bang. One touch. Score. That's a fantastic goal. So he's made himself a little bit of space. And he's, um, yeah, he scored. Well done. So Arsenal on the ball now. And Saliba has it. A little bit of pressure from McBurney. But the pressure comes in at that point. There you go. So that was our winger stepping in and pressing along with the center forward um, at the front part of our pressing zone. They didn't do anything much with it at that point because, again, we're on balance. So if I want them to do it a little bit quicker, I could either increase the tempo, ask them to take more risks, or pop up the mentality to attacking like I did before. But the point was, again, you saw that press come off and two players converge, put the pressure on, and make a tackle from the blind side right on the halfway line, which is a feature of the mid block. And now we've again got a set piece. Hopefully we can work something. No, we can't. But it was an attempt, and he probably should have done better with that header. So... I'm going to pause that right there because I think we've gone through a lot of the different structures. I'm not going to go into high pressing right now. I think, number one, that is a little bit easier to figure out. Number two, maybe we should spend longer, even though it is a little bit easier to figure out because of the complexities involved in the high pressing game. But this has been defending in general, two different approaches to defending, pressing or standing off. The three different tenets of defending, in my view, again, that's how I look at it in terms of where you win the ball, which is your pressing structure, how you win the ball, which is your standing off or your pressing, and then who wins the ball, which positions in the field do you have that can actually win possession from the opposing team. And then we saw previously in the low block system where we were relying more on structure and we made a lot of interceptions before playing the ball out. We also saw how defensive mentality and attacking mentality with that same structure were very, very different in the way the players reacted after winning the ball. In fact, as we saw just now with that goal with Baldock giving up, he's the more offensive player and that might have had something to do with the fact that he didn't actually um, mark his man too tightly. The fact that he's on wing back rather than, let's say, fullback. Robinson, fullback defend, might have done a better job. Then again, Baldock has only marking of 12, concentration of 12. Can he track a guy like Martinelli? I don't know. In any case, this has been a lot of fun. Any comments, anything I've missed, any big mistakes I've made, anything you'd like to say, I would love to hear about it down below.